All right. It's happened. I totally forgot my lower third again. Who are you? I am a failure at lower third. Lower third failure. Lower third, third fail. So apologies, everybody, for what happened on Monday. Uh, now, I have uh, I went to Hornby Island to uh, visit the family and have a little vacation. And uh, my dad's internet's not so great. And so on Monday, I thought, you know, it was my fault that I had sort of badly chosen my technology. But it turns out <clears throat> all of Hangouts were failing on Monday. So it wasn't my fault. It was no, Google's you... fault. Yes. You were fine. They were updating. <clears throat> so, um, but boy, uh, man, going to Hornby Island in March in, in, uh, it's just, it's just, it was absolutely amazing. I always forget what an amazing place it is in March. Like, summertime, it's paradise. It's like beautiful beaches. It's just, it's gorgeous. It's like our version of Hawaii. It's Canada's Hawaii. But, but in March, it's the height of the herring season. And so all oh. the wildlife in the whole area shows up. And so there was just rafts of sea lions barking at us. Wait, hold on. Heron? The herring, bird? Herring. Okay, that makes more herring. sense. Herring. Yeah. It's like the largest biomass congregation Migration? in the world. Yeah. That's and they awesome. all show up and they just and they spawn. And so the beaches are covered in herring row like snow. Ew. Yeah, I know. I know. It's pretty gross. And so you literally are, are like it's you know, it's like this deep in herring row on across all the beaches and this, you know, and so the sea lions show up to eat the to eat the fish and the seagulls show up to eat the row and it is there was thousands and thousands of birds across the entire beaches and we saw orcas and eagles and just amazing just I, I always forget what a treat it is every year to come and see all this wildlife just all come together to this one spot to just feast so so if you ever are looking for a thing to do come to Vancouver Island in March and you will have wild more wildlife then you know what to do with. We get swans. We there there were several thousand swans that wintered over in our neck of the Mississippi. And I hadn't even realized that swans were a thing in America, like wild swans. And um, the thing is, once you realize there's wild swans, you suddenly realize that a bunch of the things you see swine see flying aren't Canadian geese, they're actually swans. And yeah, um, yeah that was cool. I don't think it's fair to call them Canadian geese anymore. They are everywhere. They now we have them, but I know you have them, and everybody has them. So our campus is infested. Yeah, and they're and they're jerks. I don't think that they are a good representative. They're not representative. No, no, they would be nicer. They'd be a lot more polite. They would every, apologize for every whacking, year, chasing you around with their big wings. We get a yearly email on campus warning people that it's breeding season and to beware of the geese because they will attack you. And that week, you see some poor soul running for their life, getting chased. And, and we should probably do astronomy cast. All right. So for those of you who have no idea what you stumbled into, you're watching a live episode of Astronomy Cast. Today, we're going to be recording episode 338, which is Copernicus. We're going to be talking about the man, uh, heliocentrism, and also you mentioned sort of like a tiny little yeah. super-existent mission, so we'll cover that a bit, um, and we'll take a half an hour to do that, or 27 to 29 minutes, depending on how well I can corral Pamela's brain. Um, and so we're glad to take any questions and comments that you might have. The way to do that is to use the Q&A app, which I have enabled on uh, on the show. So wherever you're watching this, you should be able to see, uh, it says, be part of the conversation, click to join the live Q&A on Google Plus Hangout. So of course, anywhere on YouTube, on Universe Today, wherever, you should be able to click that and add a, and add a comment. I can see a bunch of people are already doing that. So that is perfect. Um, oh, I'm a little hollow, wrong microphone. Oh, maybe, let me check. Yeah, actually, I think it is the wrong microphone. Good ear, whoever said that. Good call. There, is that better? Yeah. Okay, and let me make sure that my... Okay, so my, my recording software had the right one. Okay, good. Thanks, Guido. That's, uh, that was a good catch. Yeah, thank you. Because it probably was recording with my that microphone, which is not as good. It's pretty good, but it's not as good. Okay, so if well... If you used GarageBand, it would have told you what microphone you were using. Yeah, but it's in the Hangouts. I actually had the right, the right mic in my recording software. Okay. It's not in Hangouts. Okay. 
So now I have it in Hangouts. But uh, good, okay. But you know, even the folks in the Hangouts want to listen to the to the rich audio from. No, the, it's the, true. You know. It's true. Um, I should move what window that's located. In. Okay. Oh, and I know something that I totally forgot to do. What? My intro. So I will just do this in the background while we talk. Um, oh, and next week, uh, you were supposed to go to the LPSC this week. I did not. So we're going to bring in a ringer, I think, next week. Sandy. Right? Yeah. 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 So for those of you who don't know her, uh, Sandy Springman yeah, is, uh, works at the Arecibo Observatory and is a planetary... She's an plan asteroids girl. She, but is, I don't think that's what you take in class. Asteroids girl. Anyway, she she's an asteroid zapper. Yeah, she she zots them with radar to measure their characteristics, and she also works with a program to rescue stray animals in Puerto Rico and get them rehomed in uh, continental U.S., which I think is also very cool. The asteroids part is more cool, but I just love the fact that she's doing this great volunteerism and this great science. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, so she's she's at the LPSC. She's going to join us and will give us uh, sort of what went down. And for what is the LPSC? Just for those of it's the those Lunar and Planetary no Science Conference. It's the big conference for people who discuss uh, pretty much anything going on in our solar system. Um, so, for instance, one of the things that I saw a press release come out on earlier this week is the fact that 15% of near-Earth objects are binary, which means that if you get hit once. There's a 15% chance you're going to get hit twice. Ouch. <laughs> you don't think about that. That's that second. There, there's actually a double crater up in Canada. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, we'll tef definitely have her talk about that. Okay. So, yeah, remember all those, all those near asteroid passes? Whenever you hear about such and such asteroid has, you know, has come within... A lunar diameter, you know, lunar distance from the Earth. In many cases, Sandy has zapped a laser at it and yeah. calculated its distance and composition and yeah. shape. So, um, okay, well now I'm ready. We okay. Totally, totally uh, got her done there. Okay. Um, say when, and I will start recording. I am pressing record and waiting for it to realize I pressed record. It's recording. Sweet. I've also pressed record. Okay. Uh, testing, testing. Hello, Preston. As always, Hi, we thank Preston. you for your service to Astronomy Cast. And we uh, didn't screw up this week. Everything's perfect. Everything's perfect. Yeah, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Pay no attention. Um, okay, let's get rolling. Astronomy Cast, episode 338, Copernicus. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. So I just want to give people a preview. Um, you were going to try and go to the LPSC conference, the Lunar Planetary Science Conference, but you weren't able to make it. So we're going to bring in a ringer next week to help us out, and that's going to be Sandy Springman from the Arecibo Observatory, who knows all things planets, planetary, lunar, science, and zapping things with asteroids. So, she is, yeah. She's, and she's super. So. Yes. Um, and just another reminder of the upcoming Hangout Athon. April 26th, 27th, uh, we are going to be invading my attic because it has the best combination of internet and space, and you're going to be invading your room of turquoise walls, and uh, we're going to bring you science, science, science for 36 straight hours, and hopefully you will donate money to keep our program going. Um, that's the goal. Awesome. So just make sure you put that in your calendar. And we will, of course, nag you all relentlessly when this is coming up, and uh, so hopefully you'll get a chance to watch it. Yes, that is the goal. All right. Um, so let's get rolling then. Uh, so it's safe to say that the Polish astronomer, Nicholas Copernicus... Who may have been German. All right, well, let me, let me try that again. <laughs> 
<laughs> Which, uh, should I just say the astronomer? Okay, short question. <laughs> Um, it's safe to say that the astronomer, Nicholas Copernicus, shook up the whole universe. Well, our understanding of our place in the universe. It was Copernicus who came up with the heliocentric model, placing the sun at the center of the solar system with the Earth as just another planet. One of the most important astronomers that has ever existed, which is, uh, you know, when you think about that concept, up until that point, the general understanding, I'm sure someone came up with the idea beforehand, someone thought, well, maybe, but, you know, before Copernicus, everyone thought that the Earth was the center of the, of everything. Not true. Everybody thought this. Not true. No? Okay, so this is what I'm saying. <laughs> but, uh, there was some inkling. So, okay, so why don't you tell me, tell me what actually people knew. <laughs> so, so the vast majority of people, both scientists and, of course, everyday humans, um, thought as Aristotle had taught, that the Earth was the center of our known universe. They but, still do. Yeah, that's true. Some, some still do. Okay, that, no, please that go That hurts. Yeah. But yes, okay. But but even, even before Copernicus, there had been various scientists and philosophers who realized that's probably not the case. There, there was philo... Phil, there was Philolaus who uh, didn't put the sun at the center, but imagine there was a center that was, he called it the center of fire. Um, so, so he had a center of the universe that was not us. Um, the the uh, scientist Her Heraclides, this is going to be the episode where I truly destroy names. The, the scientist Heraclides uh, Ponticus, uh, realized that the Earth rotated on an axis and this could be part of the motion that we're seeing. There there was, of course, Aristarchus of Samoy who was the first big name behind putting the sun at the center. There were people in the Islamic world who, based on their observations, were pretty sure that the sun was at the center whose names I'm not even going to attempt to mispronounce. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Throughout history there had been person after person who, based on their observations, couldn't find a solid reason that the Earth should be at the center, but could find solid reasons for the sun to be at the center. It wasn't common thinking. This was not what everyone thought. But as you went through the literature, this was throughout the scientific liter literature, just punctuated around the globe in the sciences. But... You know, your ne I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson. I think kind of brought this up, this thought experiment that that the seeing the you know seeing the sun move through the sky, seeing the moon through the sky, you know, and that no one knew. Like it's amazing that people didn't realize what was going on. And the thing is, is that both a sun-centered universe and an earth-centered universe, they look pretty much identical from our perspective here on the surface of the planet seeing the sun move, seeing the moon move, that it's natural to assume that as the, but, as but the situation. But it's actually not. The, the problem's parallax. If you assume, as most people did, that the universe was small, that the stars aren't that far away, then you'd expect if the Earth was going around the sun that you'd see regular motion in the stars as, as the Earth goes around the sun. Because we don't see the stars moving relative to one another, and we don't see them mo moving relative to the Earth's changing location as it orbits the Sun, the natural assumption, if you believe that there's a small universe, and there's no reason not to believe that without telescopes, um, it makes more sense from the quick and dirty perspective to think that actually, no, it's an Earth-centered because the stars don't move. If, if, if the sun was at the center and the Earth was going around, the stars would move. Are you crazy? Right, and, right. And you would see them wiggling back and forth over the course of the year. So, so that, was, that was actually a very problematic part of Cosmos that I've seen several historians shred. Um, so if you actually look at the, the sociological understanding, the philosophical understanding, and the scientific understanding of the size of, of the universe, it's not intuitive. Right. I mean, it's not, people aren't dummies. They weren't, they were just as smart as us, and they worked with what they had, and they'd gone through the same thought experiments. And so it turns out, of course, that in the end, 
Uh, the, Things are normally far away. Right, they're very far away, but that parallax is perceived, and then it helps justify the evidence. It's just that, you know, they the, didn't have the telescopes. Accuracy yet. that was required just hadn't been hadn't been figured out yet. Right. Okay. So so then you know where did Copernicus come along into this conversation? So so Copernicus came along at the beginning of the 1500s, and he was someone who I think you can best describe as a polymath. He had a strong humanities background. He had a strong uh, astronomy and mathematics background. He was trained as a physician. He skewed astrology but did understand the science of astronomy. He was fluent in German and Latin. He spoke uh, Greek and, and many different languages and bits and pieces, Italian. Um, he was well versed in, in church law, canon law, um, actually came from a very religious family. He was actually encouraged by the papacy to promote his ideas on a heliocentric universe, which is something that seems to get lost in a lot of modern discussions. So through throughout his, his career he wrote papers on economics. He was the first one to realize that if you flood the society with with currency that will drive up prices. So the price of goods is proportional to how much currency you have uh, available to utilize. Um, and and that's still something that, that's used today. Um, but astronomy was kind of where his heart was. He kept returning to it over time. and. Early in his career, he wrote a 40-page outline on what would be required for there to be a heliocentric universe. Um, and, and the key is heliocentric universe. Um, this, this pamphlet was the Commentarolus, little commentary if you translate it. And it's considered to have been the, the basic outline from which he wrote his, his later on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, which was uh, published post his death. Um, there were only a few copies of the manuscript made. And what, what's interesting is everyone basically came forward and said, Copernicus, you have got to publish this. Nikolai, whatever you want to call him, you have got to publish this. But he was someone who just didn't want to be at the center of controversy. And he knew that, that the requirements to build a heliocentric universe um, were such that it would have created a great deal of, of controversy. And one of the failings of his model was it still required epicycles. So, so at the time that he was working, you had Aristotle had had promulgated the idea that um, it's an Earth-centered universe. You had Ptolemy who came forward and worked out mathematical models that had um, the Earth at the center and things moving on a variety of different circles upon circles upon circles. There was the basic notion that all of this mathematics that's getting used to try and describe the motion seen in the sky don't actually represent physical reality. So while the math requires epicycles, things don't actually have epicycles, and it's very uncomfortable if you're a scientist. And so Copernicus came along, and he he was well read. He was mathematically motivated. He he was a he could do geometry, and he he started to think through. Okay, so what's required? in order to have a heliocentric model. And, and he worked out, well, first of all, you need to have, um, well, everything has to be a whole lot bigger. So you have to move the stars far enough away that there isn't visible parallax. You have to admit that the movement of the stars is caused by the rotation of the planet Earth. Um, that one was fairly easy, but moving the stars out was fairly difficult. Um, you had to have the moon orbiting the Earth and everything else orbiting the sun. That's again going to cause some controversy. But, like I said, everyone who read his manuscript, and this included the papacy, were like, dude, they didn't use that word clearly, 
but they encouraged him to move forward with this. And, and one of the things that it amuses me to watch people forget is the papacy was behind promoting science up until Galileo and then there's this exception mark with an asterisk when Galileo came along because Galileo was someone who you would probably describe using words not appropriate for this show and he didn't like the Pope and he made fun of the Pope in his writing and, and so a different Pope eventually ended up sending Galileo to house arrest and, and his work on astronomy was part of that but it was because he ticked off the Pope more than any other reason and it was done willfully. So, so what were the big challenges to the geocentric model that the heliocentric model really tried to solve? I mean there was the I mean, I know there was like the retrograde motion of the planets, right? That was the only one it really successfully solved with Copernicus mo Copernicus's model. Well, the result so, of the brightness of the planets, how the planets got brighter and dimmer over the course of the over the course but, of the year. But that right? wasn't something that Copernicus figured out. Mm, that was okay. something that came along later. Um, Copernicus did observations, but he did like hundreds of observations, maybe he wasn't the observer that Tycho Brahe was and it was Kepler who used Tycho Brahe's work who went and was looking at, at more details. Copernicus was working quite often from cities, it's, light pollution what, wasn't what it is today but he was generally working by looking out his tower window, uh, he had to deal a lot with war, the poor guy was in Poland, he actually lost all of his books uh, that got carried off in one war event. He lost all of his instruments when uh, his home got destroyed in another war event. It wasn't the right place or time to be an observational astronomer. So what he was trying to solve was the big scale problems. In this case, retrograde motion is a big scale problem. Mars appears to go in the wrong direction period. Yeah, for people who don't understand what retrograde motion is, why don't we just give a quick explainer on that. So, so when you look at the outermost planets, as, as the Earth creeps up to them, um, moving faster on its orbit, at a certain point they will stop appearing to move in their orbit in a, if you're looking down from the top, in a counterclockwise motion around the Sun and will appear to move in a clockwise motion for a little while and this change in direction will actually cause them to trace out loop-de-loops relative to the stars. Right, and so in the sky we might see, if we're observing Mars very carefully, we'll see Mars moving in one direction and then it will sort of move up a little bit and go backwards in the sky and then come back around and keep moving back in that, in that same direction. And, and, that and was inner, a, the inner planets have the same switching from going east to west to going west to east relative to the stars, but their cause they're going behind the sun, so we actually get to see them moving in front of the sun, moving behind the sun, up and above where the sun is on the sky. Um, so it's it's only the outer planets that actually loop to loop. And I forget when Mars is in retrograde. Does that mean bad luck? I always forget which one it is. Yeah, words I can't say on air. <sighs> Take the bait. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right. And so this and so this idea that you know they had come up with these very complicated uh, s crystal sphere idea, spheres within spheres, that epicycles, that the the planets were going around these little these little miniature solar systems that were then going around the larger thing, and that explained if you can imagine these you know the people who are just listening, you have to just imagine literally like the solar system with the moons around the planets, but the planets were were going around these little circles, and so that would explain how they had this weird shape to their to their orbit and and Copernicus just simplified the whole thing by no, just No, he putting, didn't. No, he didn't. Well, he still needed some right no, without Brahe, he had right? A more complicated model than right, Ptolemy right, right. had. Right. I mean, so this is the thing everyone always forgets is Copernicus moved the sun to the center and that naturally explained retrograde motion, but his timings were wrong. None of the times for when things were in the sky doing this, that, or the other thing worked out with his model. So he kept adding epicycles. Because he, he dragged circles along with, with him like everybody did. Mm -hmm. 
So right. so just like Ptolemy, he had epicycles. Just like Ptolemy, people said his sorry, this is the standard I'm working on campus, therefore my light turns off. Hold on. Sorry, Preston. Uh, Pamela's light just went off. And now she's getting it back. Okay, that was awkward. Um, clearly, I don't move enough. Um, so, so, sorry, Preston, my lights turned off on me. Um, so, so this is the thing that everyone always gets completely wrong with Copernicus. Yes, he moved the sun to the center. Yes, he fixed the explanation for retrograde motion. But in order to get his math to vaguely represent when things actually happened in the sky, he had to add more epicycles than were in Ptolemy's model. And so his model was just as, as hairy awful, and people continued to say, this model isn't a physical representation of reality. It was only after Ptolemy, not Ptolemy, it was only after Tycho Brahe made observation upon observation upon observation from, from his island and carefully measured when did things transit, where were they, what were the separations. Um, and Kepler worked mathematical models on these amazingly precise observations that Kepler realized the math requires using ellipses instead of spheres. So Copernicus's model moved the sun. Got that right. But it wasn't simpler and it wasn't more accurate. So as you said, uh, he held on to his publication, his document, yeah. until uh, he died. Then, until he died. And so what was his sort of method for getting that out there? Well, I mean, he didn't work in isolation. He'd been working on on this omnibus document most of his professional life. His his forty page manuscript was well received. Um, it it was out there. It 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 people knew about it. But the the problem was, like I said, he didn't want to be at the center of controversy. Um, so it wasn't actually after he died that it finally got printed, but it he finally like let go of the, no, shh, don't pay any attention to the book in the corner, book behind the curtain, whatever you want to use. Um, so it got published late in his life. Um, the, the printer who, who took care of it was a Lutheran theologian, Andreas Osiander, who recognized this had the potential to be controversial as well, and he wanted it to be successful. He knew that Comer Copernicus wasn't really going to be out there tooting the read my model. Um, so he added a preface to it without asking Copernicus's permission first. Um, imagine as the author getting your book and realizing there's an anonymous preface to your book. Um, and and the preface was, was basically there to say, look, this is a way of thinking about it. This is a way of looking at it. It's a hypothesis. Um, and it starts to allow reliable computation. Um, and it doesn't have to match. I, I love the way this is phrased. It doesn't have to match what a philosopher might seek as truth. Um, so, so the book got out there, it, it really, um, he got to see the manuscript, the full printed, here you go, here's your book with the preface you didn't know it was going to have, on the day he died. Which, he lived quite a while though, I mean he lived Yeah, he lived his... into his 70s. Yeah, yeah. So, so in his 70s, he's, he's lying there, the book he never wanted to publish, um, off the printing presses, is handed to him, he flips through it, who knows how he reacted to the preface he didn't know it was going to have, and he has a struck of dice. Like th that day? Yes. Like within minutes of someone Well, I don't know him. if it was within minutes, but right. that day. But that day, when he was handed the final manuscript for publication, looked through it, and then had a stroke and died. 
Yeah, so he, he'd been in coma prior to that. So he basically woke up, looked at the book, had his final... Uh, one of the weird things about the human body is a lot of people who've had severe injuries, severe illnesses, come out of a coma, have this amazing awakening chemical experience, and then die. And his this moment of chemical alertness that you get right before you pass, he had to look at his book. Hmm. I like that. I like that story. So um, we have... Uh, now, there's a mission. That's right. So we're going to talk a bit about the mission that, that was named in his honor. So, so we normally give um, the spacecraft named after a human an entire episode on their own, but I just couldn't justify that for a spacecraft that was launched before I was born and didn't have an amazing, we're going to open the universe to great discoveries. We're going to um, prove once and for all that the sun is the center of the yeah, solar system. No, no, it wasn't even a sun-observing mission. No, he... he uh, the the I have to look at the name of this. Um, the orbiting astronomical observatory three was nicknamed Copernicus. It launched on August twenty first, nineteen seventy two. It is claimed to have been the most successful of these missions. Uh, it was a joint collaboration between NASA and the United Kingdom's uh, Science and Engineering Research Council. Um, and it was a mission that uh, could observe in the x-rays, could observe in the UV. Uh, it got its name because it was the 500th anniversary of Copernicus's um, life. And it was a fairly long-lived satellite lasting until 1981. Um, other than being the discoverer of long-period pulsars, the, the mission doesn't have a whole lot to commend it, so we crammed it into five minutes at the end of this episode. Now, and I'm just checking this reference, there is a European Space Agency program called Copernicus now as well. Have you been watching this? It's all about Earth observation. And so the uh, their services should go fully online in 2014. But Land we monitoring, the environment. Haven't watched yet, so it's I'm it's dead to me until it's successfully orbiting the planet. Okay. Well, no, 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 some of them are already up there. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, various space missions, but the new ones are called the Sentinel missions, and they're okay. all going to be parting. They're going to provide data to this this service, the system called Copernicus. So. Okay. So, uh, there is sort of another whole series of operations, all very Earth based, very. You know, placing the Earth at the center of our interest. <laughs> so, so that that There's exists. There's irony. As well. There is some irony there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I think the where you were getting at it was really great. That that Copernicus had, you know, had a, almost a lucky hunch that he, you know, he looked at everything and and just kind of said, hey, what if we're looking at this all wrong? What if we place the the sun at the middle and place the planets around it? But it really took Brahe and yeah. Newton to take these ideas, and Galileo to take these ideas and find the evidence and refine it and really put by the Newton. nail in the, you know, and really Newton. I mean, Newton. No, but by Newton, we already completely accepted the, the whole planet's round, we have a new world orbiting the sun. Newton just explained why this was true, which is useful. Gravity is a good yeah. thing to know about. But it was really a triple punch of Brahe's observations, Kepler's mathematics, Galileo being a word I can't say so his, that the ideas got out there. His, his observational uh, evidence. And, no, you right. can so have you're saying, all the observations you want, but unless people listen to you. Yeah. And the thing about Galileo is he was the guy who was out there going, look at what I did. He and Copernicus were about as opposite as you could get. His trollish behavior. Yes, yes, his trollish Gal Galileo behavior. Galileo was, right, right. Um, read Galileo's Daughter if you haven't. It's, it's an amazing book by Davos Sobel. 
and and it really kind of makes you go, wow, I'm glad I didn't know Galileo. Bravo, great job, but wow, I'm glad I didn't have to deal with you. Yeah, I was like reading the I read the biography of Steve Jobs. Like <laughs> same thing, you know. Like I love the uh, the your computers. I wouldn't want to have worked for you. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Pamela. <laughs> My pleasure. All right. Stop. Save. Okay. Yes. Save. Export. Yes. We'll put that in the oh, new thing to announce while we're in the saving phase. There is going to be a new Hangout series that CosmoQuest is collaborating with the Google Lunar X Prize on. And so starting next Tuesday, um, we are going to be doing, or at least I'm going to get to host a um, every Tuesday that isn't a holiday series where we interview various uh, Google Winner X Prize teams, and that will be cool. That's very cool. Um, We're going to be alternating when we do it, so that every other week, excluding the weeks that have holidays, is primely timed for either Europe or Asia, which means it's always a kind of sad time in America. Um, well, you know, finally. Europe and Asia get some some love from from our from our crew. Yes. <laughs> because we're always running stuff that's pretty rough for a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay, so over on Google on YouTube, Don Tobugget says, Fraser Kane, your question was on the Star Talk podcast. Yes, it was. So for those of you who don't know, I, I asked a question on Star Talk, uh, which is the Neil deGrasse Tyson thing about isn't the fact that there's no time travelers evidence that there can never be time travel? And Neil deGrasse Tyson agreed with me. So um, it was uh, it was good. It was good. I like the Star Trek. Star Trek is a great podcast. If you don't listen to it, by all means, go and and, and listen to Star Talk. And Radio Lab and and Radio Lab and Planetary Radio and there's so much good stuff. I mean, Ra Radio obviously Lab we're the best. I mean, you know, favorite. you should listen to us first. But no, no, no. I, you know, there's a reason why we keep losing Parsec awards to, to those guys because yeah, they're so I, good. I, I would give my beloved giant monitor in order to get the budget to have Preston edit at the same quality that Radiolab edits, but we don't have enough money yeah, to ask him to do that. Well, I think Jad Abumrad is is a, is just a monster <laughs> editor. But yeah. Um, uh, right. So, uh, so that's the question. Okay. Uh, Chris Adams asks, did Copernicus run into trouble with the church for his ideas in the same way that Galileo did? No. Was Poland at the time a little more open than the heliocentric idea than Italy? And as you, no. you mentioned... Yeah, no, it was cool. He, he yeah. discussed his ideas with the papacy, and they encouraged him to publish and uh, discuss his work more fully. Um, no, the... the the real issue Galileo ran into was Galileo, who was originally funded by the papacy, wrote some um, parodies that just outright mocked the Pope of the time as being an idiot. And there's certain people you shouldn't mock, and those who have the ability to commit you to house arrest for the rest of your life are on the list of people you shouldn't do that with. Yeah. It's like if you live in North Korea and make fun of Kim Jong-ol. You just shouldn't do these things, and right. Galileo did. Right. So no, Copernicus, Copernicus studied, studied canon law. He um, had a position in the church. He was funded in part by the church. Um, he had no problems with the church. There, there was like one dude who at some point um, made a comment along the lines of, well, this heliocentric stuff can't be true because in the Bible it says that so-and-so made the sun, sun and the moon stand still during battle and they didn't say made the earth stand still. That's the only argument biblically for um, a geocentric model 
and pretty much everyone is willing to say, yeah, so that that really is called artistic license. Um, uh, Elid Avron says, I would say that the fact that Venus and Mercury only appear next to sunset or sunrise would be a major hint at a heliocentric universe. You think that, but if you draw the circles right, um, you can do the timings so that they're orbiting the Earth and stay near the Sun. Yeah, I mean, people spent 2,000 years really making those epicycles work perfectly, that the yeah. math worked out great. And that's yeah. the thing, right? Was, was as soon as you flipped over to a new paradigm, the math went all wrong. So, um... Paul Gracie, required ellipses. Yeah, Paul Gracie said, was papal interest in studying a heliocentric universe related to the defense of the Roman solar calendar versus other cultures' insistence on a lunar calendar? Um, I don't know specifically uh, if that had interest to other papacies, but at the time of Copernicus, it was mostly scientific interest. I mean, the, the, the churches for a long time, especially with the Jesuits, um, had strong science divisions. And uh, there, there's a reason that the papal castle is also an observatory. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a real emphasis in some cases in in helping science, especially in the Renaissance. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of motion forward, and, and the church, a lot of the, the ideas did come from the church, a lot of that pushing the, I don't know, the creation, the wonder of the creation, trying to understand the creation, whatever. It's It feels like, you know, there was, it was, if it was going too fast, too far, it was pushing against personalities that you would start to get some situations. Obviously the Inquisition was a pretty terrible, a terrible Wait, time. No, there, there was lots of stuff that went terribly, horribly wrong. Yeah. The, the schism, the wars related to it, the Holy Roman Empire, there was a whole lot of wars related to it. There's certain things you shouldn't mix, and coloniza colonization and war along with religion are, are top on my list. Inquisition, witch hunts, all of that was pretty horrible. But when it came to... Um, <clears throat> doing people in over science, it, it generally didn't happen unless it was the excuse because they did something else. Um, so, so like Gerardino Bruno, for some reason in the recent Cosmos episode, they said that it, he was killed because of his um, scientific ideas. No, he was killed because he got into mysticism and heresy and left the monastery and uh, generally became kind of like creepy cultish dude. Hmm. Um, so yeah, the, the church in general only killed people off for science if it was an excuse for something else. And in many cases, some of the resources, the kinds of people who had time to think and write and they were, they were monks. literate and they could write letters and yeah. and the kinds of philosophy and stuff that that they would have to think about fell into their wheelhouse. So yeah. Um, I think now there is, you know, an awful lot. It's really become quite polarized. There's, mm -hmm. You know, most of the anti-science now is very religiously based, which is which is really unfortunate. Which, so. And it's a Protestant thing, not a Catholic thing. Hmm. Um, and it was actually I don't want Martin to start Luther. Off religious holy war now. But. No, yeah, no, I know. It was actually Martin Luther who made the, the comment about. Um, the sun and the moon standing still during battle. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's really strange to look and see how modern culture rewrites history without looking at the details. Which it always has. Yeah. I mean, let's look at, like, uh, Christopher Columbus, right? Yeah. I mean, talk about a rewritten history. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Um, rename Columbus Day, please. Yeah, what, what was the suggestion to rename Columbus Day? Oh, I forget what someone had named it. Was, it. Someone, yeah. And there was something around that time that would be. Yeah, I remember signing a petition in favor of it, and then like I Exploration Day or something. Exploration like that. Day, yeah, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. It was to celebrate everything from the Spirit of St. Louis crossing the the Atlantic to, to the space program. To, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a good one. So Ranko Prozo asks, and uh, what are your opinions on the new inflation discoveries? 
I need to read the journal article, and I haven't had a week that allowed that yet. Have you been following this at all? Have you been... The fact that it made Andre Lind react like a 16-year-old girl who just got asked to the prom was all I needed to know to know the results were solid. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to go into this in great depth on Friday with the Weekly Space Hangout. The gist is that they have uncovered uh, fluctuations in the in the sort of cosmic microwave background radiation that... that are indicative of gravitational waves that occurred during, during the, inflationary, the inflationary, inflationary epoch. And this was not the first discovery of gravitational waves. Nobel Prize already given for that. It went to two folks from the University of Massachusetts who did their work in, I believe, the 80s. Um, this was the first evidence of pretty much anything from before the cosmic microwave backgrounds was formed. Yeah, I mean, we've mentioned this before, that gravity is the one thing that lets you see through what would normally be opaque. Yeah. That gravity is the one thing. Like, you could, you could look into a black hole with gravity, which, you know, and you could look into the very earliest moments of the, of the Big Bang with gravity. It's the one thing that you can see. So, so this is really exciting. Yeah. Um, so we'll we'll talk, we're going to talk about it a ton on Friday, and you know I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, uh, Eric Charlin says I like the last episode of Cosmos. Neil is amazing. So I haven't seen the Sunday night episode. I watched the first one, and I I really liked it. Um, I hmm. Uh, it definitely was, I mean, for me, it was a lot of stuff that I obviously clearly, you know, I've had my seven-year astronomy education with Dr. Pamela Gay. I'm, you know, I think I deserve my PhD at this point. But, <laughs> uh, so, and all the other work that I that I do as well. So, uh, but it was great. And Neil is, I really think, a worthy heir to the to the throne for for Carl Sagan and uh, I mean you know him personally and have you know been in many astronomy conferences with and seen him as you say hold court and just yeah. with a whole crew of people just listening to him expound these these ideas and theories the, the thing that I've seen that I, I actually haven't seen him do that so much what, I, what I've seen him do is give the exact same talk to multiple audiences and change the way he presents even the exact same sentences in some cases to match what is most appropriate for the audience in front of him. He has a versatility of pre presentation style that's extraordinarily rare. And it's that versatility that allows him to go from talking to academic audiences to talking to media to talking to upper middle class, to talking to someone with no education on a street corner. Um, all of these different audiences have different expectations of who they expect a scientist to be. And if you don't meet a person's expectation, they don't listen to you. It's, it's the, the reason that people instantly assume if you have a southern accent, you're stupid. We make assumptions based on presentation style. And he makes his presentation style in every way from body language to linguistical nuance match what his audience expects. And so the, th the issue with Cosmos is almost like they're not really turning him loose. That, that it's, you know, that it's someone else's script, it's someone else's plan, it's, he's being the presenter and so he's bringing that presence, but, but his understanding and ways of explaining this material are his own and are fantastic, and he's not getting the chance to kind of run with his he's way. He's not being given the opportunity Carl Sagan had to stand in a room and present on the sound stage his explanations. His explanations, yeah, exactly. And, 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 Carl, and so when you listen to Carl Sagan's, it was very poetic, and it was very, you know, he had a way of, of bringing across the wonder and the, and the awe of what he felt in the Carl Sagan way, and this is not Neil deGrasse Tyson putting putting across his ideas and his and his methodologies. You know, his way of thinking. He's following a script, and I he's and I think he's the presenter. You know, he's the presenter, and it would have been great if he was not only a presenter, but he was the person who was actually figuring out what things would get said in what order and what way. And I don't know what what involvement he got, but but he's. Uh, 
Yeah, that's all. And so that's my only sadness is, is it's almost like it's not enough Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's too much Carl Sagan, and he's not Carl Sagan. He's Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he's got his own way. And if, if you go back and you look at some of his some of his talks on uh, on YouTube. skepticism, yeah, just go on YouTube and do search some of his stuff. It is all fantastic. He, you know, he will in short sound bites and in longer talks he's just he's terrific on on every level so so that's all i think i just would have preferred to see more of his thinking than than the sort of the sum collection of all the people involved yeah what what's going to be interesting to see is they spent millions on publicity for this and it will be interesting to see if they're able to capture a full range of the fox gamut because Fox Network isn't exactly known for um, its scientific biases. And yes. it'll be interesting to see what fraction of, of the audience of the various Fox Networks it's able to capture and what networks it eventually ends up playing on, because now it's currently playing on multiple networks. Um, but that financially can't be maintained, so where's it going to land in the long run? Uh, Michael Jobin suggests uh, North American geese, which I like. <laughs> North America, that, that sounds fair. North American geese, not Canadian Evil. geese. Um, uh, hold on, where's the one? Eric Charlin says, need people like Fraser and Pamela, but with biology. Any suggestions? Emily Finke. She doesn't do a podcast, but... No, which is her video series, yeah. Bug Girl. Bug Girl, yeah. I don't know if she does a podcast, but she does writing. She's now working at Wired. Boudini does some great podcasting. Also does, does some Google Hangouts on... Uh, Naked Scientists. Uh, um, they, they're led by a physician. I think he's actually a neurologist. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's some good ones out there. Um, Tony Lynch says that Copernicus probably would have considered himself Prussian, which I think is a good... You know, yeah, the, yeah. The region where he comes from was the Prussian Empire. So, yes. Which no longer exists. And there's, there's arguments over whether he should be considered Polish or Germanic. Arstrosaw notes... Um, I think the lack of time travel only proves that we don't invent time travel, not that it's impossible. I think it's a great point. Yeah. So, so we will never invent it, but it could still be possible, but no one will ever figure it out. But wouldn't that be the weirdest thing if you knew that like, fusion would never be invented? If there's some way to see now that fusion would never be invented, then nobody would ever try to invent a fusion reactor. I read this amazing time travel book that left me just like crying while reading it and I can't remember its title and now I want to inflict it on its our audience but I don't remember its title remember so I have it. to look it up. See, I always imagine like uh, you know Hitler's uh, Hitler's guards very accustomed to time travelers that their whole apartment would just be filled with time travelers popping in and you know always showing up in the bathroom because they think that you know, no one's going to be <laughs> yeah. looking. And so it's just crammed top to bottom from, uh, yeah, with, with time travelers. Um, <clears throat> Elad Avron notes that SGU tackles biology often, which I think is true. Yeah. Um, Emily Grassley from Brain Scoop. Sylvan Westby notes that. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Give us your recommendations. Who, who kind of does a great job of handling biology and even even other stuff, you know. Radio Lab, Radio Lab. I'm just going to keep lab, saying Radio, radio lab. lab. Yeah, yeah. They they go off on some pretty crazy tangents. I mean, not in the same level of of just. I mean, don't get me wrong. Radio Lab is the greatest thing to listen to ever, uh, but they don't handle something kind of comprehensively. It's not like you can start listening and get a comprehensive education in biology. With no, some structure true. in the way that we do with with astronomy. So, if anyone wants to steal our idea, take it, please. I'm happy to explain what we do. So, if you want to make your version of astronomy cast, but biology, we'd love to see it. First, you have to I'm find a Pamela. That's the. I think that's your problem. <laughs> so, so I'm I'm still looking for this, but there it is, Doomsday Book. It's it's by Connie Willis. And um, 
it, it discusses a student who is part of her research goes back to historic England and accidentally lands herself in the middle of the plague and it's just heartbreakingly beautiful cool um, okay well I think I picked out all the um, yeah James Greatbrook says agreed about the Radiolab tangents love it but a little wooey and that's wooey and woo woo and and I, I I'm I pick out the specific episodes to listen to, so it could be that, really? that I've missed Fast the forward woo. To movie ones, yeah. Yeah, they did a whole section on Abraham and Isaac at one point, and I just went like, what? What are you thinking? So, and I wasn't the only one. So, um, uh, Their okay. one on the pitch drop in time was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, I know most of the time they, they nail it. Um... Okay, well, I think I've pulled out all of the things. So uh, next up, then, uh, we're Wednesday right now. Are you going to be doing, is there going to be a learning space tonight? Yes, yes. And Mike Simons from Astronomers Without Borders will Yay. be on air. Awesome. Mike is great. Mike has become a regular contributor to a lot of the stuff that that we do. Yeah. I met Mike at uh, Sci Fu last year, and uh, I'm he's been so a real jealous. great. Yeah, I know. I, I haven't got my invite this year, so I don't know if I will. Um, but he's been a really great uh, contributor to a lot of the stuff I we've been doing. I want to go so. to Sci Fu. Yeah, yeah, I know. Everybody does. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to say it was the greatest experience of my life, but it was up there. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, uh, so thanks everyone for watching, and we will see you all, if not uh, tonight, then we'll see you on Friday when we do the Weekly Space Hangout. It will be the confirmation of inflation space hangout, I, I guarantee it. I, I know already Dr. Matthew Francis is gearing up his skepticism, so uh, yeah, hang tight. It's going to be a controversial episode. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks, Pamela. Bye-bye.